Hey everybody, hope you're having a great start to the new year so far. Doug here, one of the host, producers, and creators of the Genre of Your Life podcast, bringing you all a review roundup slash audio newsletter this week. Again, hope you're having a great start to the new year. Hopefully 2024 is treating you well so far. Uh, we have a lot to review for you guys this month. A lot of fun episodes coming down the pipeline. Um, if you haven't already listened to our first episode of the new year, we play the Blumhouse production game. It's a lot of fun. I kind of quiz both, quiz all three, Moses, Nick, and Joel on their knowledge about their Blumhouse productions. Is it a, Bl- is it a Blumhouse movie or not? It's a lot of fun, so go back and listen to that. Uh, hopefully we'll play more games uh, this year and this upcoming weeks on the ep- on the podcast. But we have a lot in store for you for 2024. We're just getting started. And look out for my Mean Girls review coming out this weekend as well. But as always, guys, you can find the show on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, or your favorite podcast platform of choice. While you're on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or wherever your podcast needs are needs are met, uh, hit that follow button, hit the, hit the subscribe button. Please leave a review. Please leave a rating too. It helps us out so, so much. Really, guys, we want to hear from you. Please give us a rating. Please give us a review. We want to hear from you all. Are you liking the show? Not liking the show? Hey, that's fine. We just want to hear from you all, you know, because, again, we had a great 2023. Thanks to you all. But please don't be shy. Leave a review. Leave a rating. And share the word with us to your friends, family, fellow podcast uh, fans. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, also have a full audio show on our YouTube page, youtube.com backslash Midway Avenue Production. So we have a lot of content coming down the pipeline for you all. And hopefully, I'm working out the kinks right now. Hopefully, we get the video aspect element of the podcast going for you all. Uh, hopefully, I'm trying to get it done by or started by at least March because we have a lot of reviews coming down. A lot of things to kind of like talk about. More Again, more games to play. Hopefully, I have a few more guests on uh, these upcoming months and this year. So we have a lot. Like I said, a lot in store for everyone in 2024 and it's gonna be a really fun and exciting year but as always guys thank you so much for your ongoing support it means the world to us all righty so i'm a little behind a little late on these reviews but i want to get them you know out and kind of just like get talking with you guys you know like i said i saw a lot of great movies before the year ended after i put out my top 10 and it was just like oh there was so much to watch i'm still behind i still haven't seen grand turismo yet i haven't seen, I haven't seen maestro yet and i love bradley cooper uh you know we watched the golden globes zeta and i this past weekend and yeah for better words you know it wasn't the best show personally it just it kind of felt a little boring at times and um it just kind of felt just kind of like out of place a little bit but um you know it's a award show sometimes. We have a bit, a bit of a hit or a miss, but we do have a lot to review and catch up on. So look out. Make sure you have notifications on. Make sure you're up to date with our with our with our podcast feed, whether it's in Spotify, Apple, or your favorite podcast platform of choice. And yeah, guys. So let's see. So first up on the list is gonna be uh the new Sydney Sweeney and uh Glenn Powell rom rom com anyone but you and you know i'm a sucker for rom-coms i really am i'm a sucker for rated r comedies and theaters you know i do think because of covid as well as the rise of streaming we've seen less and less comedies on the big screen i think it's definitely more they've definitely turned more to a streaming genre unfortunately but you know i kind of miss the days of seeing you know neighbors or um kind of era like super bad and held in kumar and bridesmaids and you know a lot of great movies uh right along barbershop thing like a man you know i miss the era of seeing comedies on you know in the big on the big screen with the big audience because you know both horror and comedy is definitely the place to be is at a movie theater no matter what um so i'm glad you know this past year we saw stuff like strays and no hard feelings and joyride i'm glad that kind of like the the comedy was back in theaters. Most of the rated R raunchy comedies were back. And this was definitely part of, up there with them, if you ask me. Um, so, yeah, it was fun. It's really, it's, again, it's, it's fun to seeing a comedy like this in a, in a, on, on the big screen with an audience. And you know what? Well, for starters, actually, this movie's basically about Glenn Powell, Sidney Sweeney. The have history with each other. And one day they're going to a wedding. And it turns out Glenn Powell's uh, friend is marrying uh, the sister of a girl he kind of had a one night stand kind of a thing with and it didn't end well at all so they're kind of like back in each, back in each other's lives unfortunately and they're forced to kind of be with each other during this weekend getaway oh it's this sorry this wedding get destination wedding in australia and it's kind of just them like trying to get to know each other trying to like pretend to like each other to kind of like you know this get everyone off their backs you know their family family friends um so kind of like a 
enemies to lovers kind of uh, premise and again done before but you know what this movie's a lot of fun it really is you know the chemistry between Sydney Sweeney and Glenn Powell is really charming it's a lot of fun to watch uh, both really good actors both kind of like really popular like rising actors you know obviously with Sydney Sweeney uh, stuff like Euphoria and she's a huge a lot of television show a lot of movies and Glenn Powell really from Top Gun Maverick his kind of fame but you know I loved him since I saw him and uh, Everybody Wants Some back in 2016 which is one of my favorite movies of all time he's so charming he's very delightful in that movie but I've had my eye on this guy for a long time of like oh he's gonna be a star one day and obviously with the success of Top Gun Maverick kind of just like shot him up the roof of just like popularity so it's definitely cool to see two rising stars kind of like do some kind of fun like this like i said the chemistry works between two of them you know they're bickering they're kind of like tension and hot sexual energy definitely works throughout the movie um and there's a lot of laughs too you know to me i thought the really big pros though were the supporting cast whether it's gata from uh the show dave which is little dicky's kind of like hype man and one of his best friends He's really funny in this. He's, he steals the show whenever he's in his scenes with his stepdad and his family. Um, you know, it's everyone from the from the parents to the the, the two girls getting married uh, to get to Gata to the, the parents, like literally like, the family members, the ex boyfriend, ex girlfriends. Like, it's a fun. It's a really fun ensemble piece. And you know, besides the two Sydney Sweeney and Glenn Powell, it's a lot of like kind of just like not too big celebrities and it's kind of fun because you know it it's an ensemble piece works very really well around Sydney Sweeney and Glenn Powell and you know the guy who made this movie made Easy A who I, and I absolutely love Easy A one of my favorite comedies of all time and Emma Stone is just phenomenal in that but you know I'm glad that Sony and uh him they, they really pushed for this movie to be um they really, they really push they really push this movie you know, to be a theatrical release. And I think I really do. I get, I get a lot of props to Sony, Sony Pictures, um, Will Gluck, who was the writer, director, co-writer and director of this movie, that they wanted this to be a theatrical release. This could have been a Netflix or Hulu movie easily, but I really like that. It, it was like a, it's going to be a theatrical no matter what. And, you know, critic wise and other reviews, not so, they didn't do the best, but for a lower, I want to say like 30 mil or less budget movie, it has a pretty good return. And, you know, when Zayda and I saw it, after the after the after Christmas, uh, we went to the theater near, near us, and it was pretty packed. You know, like at when we, when I bought, when we booked our tickets, it was kind of empty. But when we got to the theater, it was pretty packed. Like the first like couple rows were all booked. I mean, only available seats were like the first two rows. So I was like, huh, maybe word of mouth, maybe like seeing it on TikTok, the ads on TikTok or YouTube or social media was kind of word of mouth. But I was really happy that it happened because again, like, it's it's very important for us to kind of keep supporting. Um, a quote unquote original movies, which is this is original movie, but in terms of the rom com, and you know it's been done, it's been done before, but it's still an original rated R comedy, which we see a lot of those unfortunately going to streaming or just, um, or just kind of just like not as much, not made as much anymore. So I don't know it's a lot of fun. Like I said, Gata for sure is something the big standout, but it's. A lot of joke. It's really cute. It's really fun at times. Again, it's really it's beautifully shot in uh, for a rom com. You know, it uh, for for a mid lower tier budget movie it shot really well it shot in australia on location again i love seeing movies more and more movies shot on location instead of green screen because i feel like green screen is kind of the easier approach to shoot movies nowadays because of budgeting and time and schedules obviously and obviously because of covid that was definitely a big factor but now definitely it's definitely really cool to see that like some movies are still being shot even like the lower budget movies like this or sorry mid-tier budget movies like this it's a lot of fun but like i said is it original is it anything original no We've seen the typical, I don't like you kind of thing. We'll never end up together to like, oh, we're going to be, we're going to be like lovers, we're going to be boyfriend and girlfriend. It's been done in like a lot of Adam Sandler movies, a lot of like, a lot of rom-coms the past forever, basically. But the charm of the movie really is the chemistry between the two leads, but also again, the supporting cast is a lot of fun or great, a lot of funny references to like old, you know, mid 2000s music and trends and vibes um again it's a lot of like the unknown actors uh like kind of bring their a game turns them kind of just like uh kind of quirky jokey humor um and it just works you know it's a to me i just like the vibe of like a like happy positive kind of like comedy movie you know i think coming out during the holidays of course but also just in life you know we see a lot of kind of just like really dark and really kind of just like heavy material in movies and shows nowadays it's just fun to escape like kind of like a quirky goofy kind of little like silly rom-com i do think that really that this is definitely you know no hard feelings was definitely my no i think stray is my favorite comedy of the year 
I know hard feelings. I like, I like Joy Ride a lot. I would put no. I would put um. I would put anyone but you maybe top of maybe up there with Strays and No Hard Feelings. Again, it's tough. It was really this was a really good year for comedies. I think the only the last good year of comedy movies for me was definitely 2018 when we had stuff like Blockers and Game Night and Tag. Like that was kind of the last like good year of like funny movies like that in, in theaters and. All three of those movies did moderately well for the most part, but you know I really haven't seen a, a movie like, a year like that for comedies in quite some time. So I think twenty twenty three, you know, five years since twenty eighteen definitely was kind of like in lieu or kind of in vain, like kind of similar to that. So yeah, like I said, a lot of it's a lot of fun. The jokes, la- the jokes definitely worked for me a lot. I was laughing out loud multiple times, and the trailers didn't really sell me as much. It was kind of marketed kind of weird too. It was kind of very delayed in marketing until like the end of the year. A lot of a lot of promotion during kind of like CinemaCon back in April, stuff like that. A lot of kind of footage was there, but like for the public guy, it wasn't a lot of stuff to market or show to us. Maybe like till the end of the year, so it definitely was a bit of like a end of the year kind of thing. But it was fun. I'm glad it's doing well. Um, some of the chemistry did not work with like the ex boyfriend, ex girlfriend kind of thing, um, and a little, a little overacting at times. I will admit that. But you know, if you're going in for a good time, have some laughs. You know, from kind of like some kind of like a little raunchy humor here and there. Not too much as raunchy as like a joyride or no hard feelings or strays, obviously, but it's fun. And I, I like, like, I like, like, like Will Gluck is kind of going back to his roots of like comedies, like easy a or friends with benefits, stuff like that. Cause it's fun. It's, he, he knows, he knows how to get good comedic performance out of his actors and kind of just like have a lot of heart too. I think easy. A has an example of like so much kind of like humor and jokes, but a lot of heart to that movie as well. I think Will Gluck is very good at, kind of uh pairing um uh pairing pairing leads together actually so yeah definitely again if you if it's still playing in theaters i'd definitely recommend seeing it i would give it a seven out of, seven seven half out of ten it surprised me for sure it's a lot of fun uh don't go in like oh it's gonna be the next like you know my best friend's wedding or something like that or like the wedding singer or whatever it's not it's not like that whatsoever but if you want looking for something light have a good time very you know good hearted and you know kind of cute and joyful good soundtrack this is definitely it. But like I said, the the really heart of this movie is the ensemble with Gaeta, Alexander Alexander Ship. Um, what's his name? He was in Scream and a lot of stuff too. I'm blanking on his name. Uh, Derma Maroney, I want to say that's his name. Uh, I got the two guys confused. The other guy in the the camp movie campaign. Uh, but it's it's cute. It's cute. Yeah, Alexander Ship. Um, what's the guy's name? Yeah, Derma Maroney. Uh, and he's really funny. Uh, again, two girls. Uh. Alexander Ship and Haley uh, Hadley Robinson, uh, Haley Robinson, like the, it's the ensemble. The ensemble really kind of makes it like a fun time, and it's fun seeing just like the secondary ensemble characters kind of like react around Glenn Powell, and Sydney Sweeney. And like I said, really the chemistry there is really there between Sydney Sweeney and Glenn Powell. So yeah, guys, seven, seven out of ten. I had a really good time with it. I was really surprised with it. I kind of went in with kind of low expectations, and I had a good time with it. It's again, it was fun again. Having the theater kind of kind of crowded too, uh, definitely kind of added my kind of like exp- kind of added to the experience of being in a really joyful comedy setting on the big screen. So I definitely recommend anyone but you. All right, flipping gears here to a movie that's going to be completely opposite, and I mean completely opposite is the new A twenty four movie, The Iron Claw. I was hearing a lot about this movie during when it was like the first look was being released of like the all four brothers, uh, you know, all the actors paying, being cast. Um, everyone is, it's, it's one of the most anticipated movies of 2023. I'll be flat out honest, guys. I had zero, and I mean, I had zero interest in this movie. I'm not even kidding. I kind of feel bad saying now because I didn't know about the story, obviously, or yeah, I'm not a wrestling, I'm not a wrestling fan. At all, like I, all my, all my friends were wrestling fans growing up. I had a family that like wrestling. I could never get into it. I was always bored out of my mind. So when I heard, oh, Zac Efron, eight twenty four wrestling drama, I was like, pass. I never saw the trailer for it. Everyone was sharing it and like tweeting it and reposting it. I was like, it's not like doing for me. Like it's not like doing it for me. Like I wasn't even into boxing until I saw like you know Rocky growing up and like Creed. Uh, but to me, I was just like, okay, another another drama wrestling movie another sports drama i'm like i'm good i don't want to see it i love a24 i'm a big zach efron fan also a big jeremy allen white fan but i was like no i'm good like, I, i'm good i don't want to see this whatever 
and then it started coming out. Critics were seeing it, a lot of like word of mouth through social media and stuff like that. And I was hearing this like, wow, like this is like this is the movie of the year, man, movie of the year. And I was like, okay, like oh, sure, no interest. Wasn't until my friend, I showed up to my boy Femi, who has a podcast, uh, Dry Clean Only. It's a great podcast. I was listening to him. He's one of the best dudes ever. Um, and one of the most funniest people you'll ever meet. Um, and then him and I like a lot of similar movies. And he's also a big A24 guy like me. And he was, we we're talking, you know, during, during, right before Christmas. And he was like, bro, I can't wait for this movie. And I was like, yeah, me, yeah, okay. I'm hearing a lot of good things, but I might go see it. Um, and we got it late. I think it came out like the major markets, like LA, Chicago, and New York first, but you know, Phoenix, we got, we, in Phoenix, we got a little bit, a little bit later. So I was like, I'll see it eventually. You know, I have the Regal limited pass now. I can walk over to the Regal and go see it. And he was texting me. He goes, bro, bro, you got to see this movie. And I was like, really? He goes, you got to see this movie. Holy shit. Like Zac Efron, man. Like this movie is something else. And I was like, okay. And you know, I, Femi's very kind of like, I like, I like this kind of like takes on movies and shows a lot. Um, and I was like, okay. I was like, yeah, all right, sure, whatever. So I went, I went to go see it, see it because of his because of his review and seeing a lot more people talking about it on TikTok and YouTube and fellow critics and fellow you know coworkers and colleagues and you know friends. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna see it. So I went in on a matinee on like a Saturday. I want to say like the Saturday before, uh, day before New Year's Eve. I walked in and it was just me and this one other guy in the theater. I sat in the back. I'm like, all right, let's see what we're in, in for. Because again, the trailers are not selling me at all. And being a re- not a big wrestling fan, I was like, what am I going to watch? I'm going to be bored out of my mind. It's going to be, uh. But I can say right now, wow. Wow. What a film. What a film, guys. This is easily one of my favorite A24 movies that I've seen in a while. A24, I want to say maybe since COVID has definitely been a hit or miss for me. Um, they have been as like consistent um, or on the same kind of like mark they were prior to COVID, you know, prior to COVID, Lady Bird, Last Black Man in San Francisco, Uncut Gems, Good Time, Mid-90s, The Lighthouse, Disaster Artists. Like they were just hit after hit after hit that like all these movies are great. But then, you know, post-COVID, I didn't care for Bo's Afraid. I don't like the dream scenario. I'm the minority here. I don't really care for everything everywhere all at once. I saw a little bit too late too. I think I saw that after the whole multiverse and hype of the movie. I was very multiverse out after Spider-Man and Marvel and DC and uh, like it was, I was I was kind of just done. I was kind of done with the multiverse stuff. I think Michelle Yeoh and uh, Kihui Kwan were phenomenal and they rightfully deserved their Oscars. But the movie to me just did not work as well as I wanted it to. Again, it's still an okay movie, but I didn't really love it the way everyone else did. But I'm glad that a24 and an original movie did win best picture and the actors who won definitely were well deserved of the other no- of their wins and nominations uh but to me just they have not been consistent i c- i still haven't seen priscilla i didn't really care for bodies 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 honestly it's just like i was just seeing hit miss after miss i was like man a24 is not hitting it for me the way they used to so but so yeah this is easily by far one of my new favorite a24 films but also one of the best a24 films they put out in quite some time like no joke like i was like wow I, w- I walked out just like just like speechless i was like this is this movie was just took me by surprise and just like kept going and i was like oh my this movie is just, it's it, it's 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 really a what a movie <laughs> really what a movie like i said i'm not a wrestling fan like i said trailers do not interest me whatsoever but to me this is not a sports movie it's not a wrestling movie this movie is a character study on the Von Erich family. And what I said in my reaction too was that I was not familiar with the Von Erich family or their tragedy at all. All I knew was kind of like, it's sad. And I told my mom, I might see this movie called The Iron Claw. And my, and my mom was like, oh, what a sad story. And I was like, hey, that's all I hear. I don't want to hear what happens, obviously. So like, I went in not knowing what the family, what the family tragedy and the drama was. And I'm glad I did because it kind of made the movie even better for me and the experience way better for me. Uh, so to me, this movie to me is devastating. It's tragic. It's moving when you see how much love these brothers had for each other and the family dynamic. But really, I did not know what to expect going in. And I would just, it hit me, man. As a brother myself, having a younger brother, like, oh man. Like I remember walking out just feeling just so emotional, feeling just like sad, but also just moved of like, how beautifully this movie was made and just the performances from across the board. Like, man, oh man, it just stuck with me. And like, I saw it now, was it now two weeks ago? And it's still sticking with me. I'm like, wow, this movie 
it just stayed with me. I'm still thinking about it. I was telling Zeta about it. I was telling my friends about it. I was telling my family about it. You got to see this movie. You got to see this movie. I was kind of just like feeling like Femi, actually. I'm like, I see this movie, man. I got to see this movie. And I was just like, wow. Like, this movie is just something. It did something different. It just really, again, I'm not a, I love movies about, I love character study movies about family, certain individuals, the impact of certain things had on each other's life, stuff like that. And this movie really is one of the best character studies I've seen in a long, long, long time. And I really thought that across the board was, it was just really something special. Uh, starting off with the pros, you know, like I said, Zac Efron, who I've, I grew up watching this guy, man, from High School Musical, 17 again, Neighbors, one of my favorite comedies of all time, greatest show, man. Like, he's been a big part of my life as an actor, like, growing up from grade school, middle school, high school, college, now post, you know, post college and, you know, my adult life. It's, I love seeing, this is definitely his best performance of his career. I love, I think this is worth an Oscar nom. Even though win, if you ask me, but fortunately, I feel like a lot of these A twenty four movies that come out end of the year, like Uncut Gems, are very overshadowed or not looked on, like or or overlooked by the Academy and the SAG and Golden Globes. It's a shame because they did the same thing to Adam Sandler for Uncut Gems, and I'm just like, come on, man! Like I know it, it came out too late, or there was too much hype, and it kind of just like fizzled away. But I think his I think his performance will for sure be overlooked because he's phenomenal in this. Like, like I said, easily the best the best performance of his career. I love seeing this turn for him as an actor. Like he's taking more dramatic roles. Um, you know, I haven't seen I haven't seen Ted Bundy the Ted Bundy movie, but he's great in that too. The stuff and his character has to go through in this really hit me, and the emotion and the tragic nature he suffers in this movie. Is really present in with what he with, with what he's able to do, and his performance really shows. It's in his eyes and it's in his like body language. It's like how he reacts to things. I was incredibly impressed with what he has, was able to do in this movie, um, and it's it's really like you're just like man, this kid used to be the Disney kid to uh, kind of uh, pretty boy stuff like you know neighbors and them teen again. He's really really making a name for himself as a dramatic actor. And again, I, was, I kind of felt proud. Like I kind of like, fuck, I knew this guy. Like wow, like seeing his turn as an actor, like it was really something special. Um, I do think this would mean. I mean, my wife. I mean, that I talked about was that he's really jacked this movie more than ever. And I definitely think he was on the roids, unfortunately, because like his body is just like whoa, like it's. I mean, he was jacked in you know in Baywatch, but this is like next level stuff. But hopefully he's not, hopefully he's kind of not doing that anymore. But like, he really put his body up to something really big as the to play to, to play a wrestler in this, and it really shows of like, whoa, holy crap! But supporting cast: Lily James, Jeremy Allen White, uh, the brothers. Uh, I'm blanking on their names. I have them on my notes too. But like, all four of them really just work beautifully. And I obviously know Jeremy Allen White from Shameless and The Bear, which was one of my favorite movies, one of my favorite shows. Honestly, The Bear is one of my favorite. Sh- my favorite shows of all time, Harris Dickinson, who does a great Southern accent for for a dude from London, um, and the newcomer who plays the youngest brother, uh, Stanley Simmons, who plays Mike. Again, like that they casted two kind of unknown actors uh, with uh, with um, with Zac Efron, Jeremy Allen White. It really added the authenticity, and they were kind of like the brother. It kind of made the brotherhood feel a bit more real and authentic. Uh, but all literally all four of them, it just it works really really well. Um, the parents uh, and the guy, the guy playing the dad, always plays kind of like a yeah Holt McCallany. I've seen him as up that like he's kind of a scumbag. Whether it's Gangster Squad, Fight Club, Run All Night, uh, Wrath of the Man, like uh, or even like a Jack Reacher, second like Jack Reacher and Justice League. Like he plays really kind of schmucky, kind of just like kind of douchebag kind of like this asshole and he's kind of playing against type in this movie too but like he really does it well i'll tell you that um and the mom played by more uh more uh tyranny who i loved her since you know liar liar and was like semi-pro too uh both of them are just are are awesome as well it just everyone was cast perfectly oh sort of I, I, i'll get to that in my cons and my kind of not so good about this movie but for the most part like everyone's performance is really great Everyone's performance is really great. Like everyone is Oscar worthy. Everyone brings their A game to this movie. This despite a smaller, big, medium role, whatever, everyone brings their A game. 
except to me really what I loved a lot it was the chemistry between the four brothers it felt so real it felt so natural and you felt the love all four of them had for each other you could like they felt like real brothers they were fi- finally like real brothers they were bickering like real brothers they had like they were lovely like, they had like the hugs like real brothers like it just felt so real and all four brothers were casted perfectly and the chemistry and the love really shows it really translates well on screen it really does and not knowing anything about the, the real von Erichs before this like it felt just like really genuine really just like just full of heart and emotion just really brother, brotherly love I, I, I loved about that not like I said, not knowing much about the story, I didn't even know who directed this movie until I saw it. A guy named Sean Sean Durkin, who I was like, who like did? And so I was IMDb, did not know his filmography, didn't do a lot of stuff that I would know or a lot of mainstream stuff. So it was kind of his first kind of like real big movie, and I was like, okay, I like that. I like that. It was like, hey, you know, this is who I. It's, it's, it seems like this movie's very personal for him. He's the writer director of this movie. And I wonder if he produced it too. I want to see if he produced it. Let's see. He did. So he produced it, wrote and directed it. And to, to me, I'm just like, wow, like this guy really had a lot to say in terms of his film, in terms of his you know, filmmaking direction, in terms of his storytelling. And honestly, though, like I like that. I like that. This is like kind of his kind of like coming out as a director, as a filmmaker. Of like, look at me. This is my movie. I believe in myself. I believe in the story. I said the story seemed very personal to him. Maybe he has brothers himself. Maybe he has a family. Maybe he has sons, whatever. Or he's he's kind of grew up with the Von Erichs as well. This movie really seems to be like kind of like a love letter to him, from him to the to the Von Erichs, to brothers, to family, whatever. And I was very impressed with him as a filmmaker, as a writer. He's able to like tell this really genuine and tragic and heartbreaking story so well, so so well. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing what he does next as a as a director. Hopefully, A24 kind of brings on to do more movies like this or more stuff like this. Uh, but yeah, I, he's definitely on my radar now as a, as a filmmaker to watch. Uh, the score, man. I really am listening to more and more uh, scores from movies and shows more than ever. The score in this movie, man, I cannot get out of my head. It was riveting. It was haunting. It was at times very often moving, uplifting, kind of just like Rocky and Creed at times. And the score just like... It just stuck with me. Like I was, I was humming some of the, the score like at my apartment. I'm like walking the dog. I was like, "Oh my gosh, the score is sticking with me." I want to give a shout out to the composer of this movie, Richard Reed Perry, and he's composed nothing that I've seen before. I think he's been part of soundtracks like stuff like Mythic Quest and Love and Monsters, or Euphoria. Um, but I did not know. I didn't, I'm not familiar with them whatsoever. And man, his scores easily one of my favorite scores I've heard in a long time. But like I said, it's haunting at times. Like the kind of like a tense, like dun, 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 or like the very kind of like Rocky under, you know, underdog kind of theme. And the whole time I'm like, this score is just masterful. It's like it was giving me like John Williams, giving me Bill Conti, giving me just like Michael Giacchino, Hans Zimmer kind of vibes. And I was just like, wow, like he's able to compose so much of this emotion and love and just tragedy all within his music and i was like wow this is remarkable and again i i am noticing a lot more scores now than i did maybe five years ago and i'm just like i'm really getting some more music scores appreciating musical score who the composers are shout out to him because he did a phenomenal job with his uh music and uh composition the cinematography and camera work in this movie is insane in the best possible way I love how the DP cinematography of this movie is able to capture some of the these in the ring shots and the intensity and the intimate wrestling matches. Like you feel the sweat, you feel like the the boom, the hits, the the falls, the just like attacks. Like you really feel that, and you feel the intimate scenes with like between the brothers and and the family. You feel you're part of the family, and I was just like, wow. Like I feel like I'm watching like a documentary at times. I feel so real, but like. It felt really natural. I'm not a wrestling fan, but like I am a big sports person. I love baseball, I love basketball, and I'm a football fan. So I just really know when like sport movies are done well. I think Creed, the first Creed, is a good example of that. I think Creed two, Creed three, the whole trilogy is definitely good at that too. But like it really feels natural, and the DP of this movie really did a great job of making this feel so intense. Like you feel like you're in the ring with these guys. You feel the sweat. You feel the you see the blood. You feel the kind of this like the intensity of it all. I was just like, wow. I'm like for a lower budget. A24 movie, I was just impressed. This was like top tier, uh, even a, a top tier studio cinematography and 
detail attention, score, and cinematography. I was just like, wow. Uh, like, th- there are some, there's some shots too. There's some shots in this movie that have really dim, really kind of like eerie light, and that kind of like makes the film even feel, makes the film even kind of feel more dark and intense and even grim at times. Like when someone's in the shadows somewhere looking at in the match, or someone's watching something in, in the dark or in the, like very dim lit, it feels very really sinister and really grim. You're like, oh, like what are they trying to establish here? And how dark the movie is in terms of tragedy and emotion. Like it adds to the story uh, as a story, as a, it's kind of like a, as a, as a character itself almost at times. Uh, there's the camera work in this movie really to me, I was thinking about it like more and more throughout the weeks even before I did the review, was that the camera work in this movie, when it's slowly zooming in, it is incredible. That was spoiling. There's one shot where the dad is talking and challenging anyone to face his sons. Like, you know, the sons are top of the world right now in terms of like wrestling and, you know, the kings of Texas almost. Like, and the and the dad's kind of like speaking for them in a way because he's a bit of a bit of a prick. Uh, and the way that this dad, the, the dad uh, is yelling in the ring, um, my sons, like, come, come, my sons, I'm talking to you, um, Ric Flair, whatever. And the camera slowly goes in. Keeps going in slowly, slowly, and it 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 like it just tracks. It's slowly moving, zooming in, and it's very steady. Not like shaking left, right. It's it's steady on the Von Eric men, all of them. Mike, uh, the uh, I'm playing on their names right now. Like Kev, Kevin, Carrie, David, and the dad Fritz, and like the cameras is slowly zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in, zooming in. And it's it's so steady with such like great pace. It's just very, just like, oh my gosh, I'm watching this video masterclass in cinematography and filmmaking here. Like, I was just like, wow, I'm just blown away by this. And it's just an incredible shot that I couldn't stop thinking about. Like, for weeks and days later, I was like, the focus is slowly on the men, and you feel it in your core. Just like, wow, how the, how precise and how intense this slow and steady zoom on these men while the dad is like just talking a lot of shit. And talking for his sons, it's like, wow, you're feeling your core with like, what am I watching? And I just thought it was just re- done remarkably well. I hear a lot of things from different, from other reviewers and other critics and even friends too. Like the pace kind of bothered them. Personally, I thought the pace was fantastic. I was never bored. Do you feel like they kind of dragged on? It had a perfect pace. Yes, it might pick up a little bit more on the second half, and the end of the second and third act. But overall, I thought the pace was done very well. Like I said, I know it's a lot more about pacing now in movies and quote unquote slower burn movies. But for someone not really kind of quote, quote unquote hyped to see this movie, I thought the pace was fantastic. It, it when it moved, it moved. When it had to settle, it had to settle. It didn't feel rushed. It didn't kind of like, oh man, slow it down a little bit. And it really had a kind of like really its own rhythm in terms of pacing and telling the story and dealing with the tragedy and dealing with like the drama and the heartbreak you're seeing with this family. And I notice a lot too in movies and shows how sometimes the accents kind of feel a little overdone or a little kind of like too much. Like, all right, you're putting on an accent we know. Everyone's accents felt so felt so real and natural. Except shout out to Harris Dickinson, who, who's a British actor. His Texas Southern accent was flawless. I didn't really hear him kind of like slipping up or kind of like, oh, I hear his British accent there. No, 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 no. He really did a great job. And Jeremy Allen White, Zach Efron, Mike, the brothers, like everyone's accent, like uh, really did, really did a great job of making it feel authentic. It didn't feel like, oh man, you can tell this is definitely an accent. Maybe he had good uh, uh, dialect coaches or great kind of acting coaches, but like really what I was super impressed with their, everyone's uh, Texas Southern accent. There's a seat I call it the Rocky montage when three of the brothers who are who are athletes reunite together and start wrestling together. It was definitely given like Rocky Bill Conti uh uh kind of like training kind of just like in the ring kind of montage vibes. But I loved it though. I really do. I, as someone who loves the Rocky franchise and the Creed franchise fr- Creed franchise, it was definitely kind of a homage to like the sports movies that like we all grew up on from the '90s, the '80s, and '70s, and even the early 2000s. Um, but it wasn't dragged on. It wasn't like okay, enough with the montage. We get it. Perfect length. It didn't feel too long, or it didn't feel like hey, I could, I could use more of that. It was really a perfect length of montage. Well, something that I I will notice too. I get I'm only 26, but like I do notice that a lot of movies definitely rely on not nostalgia with its reboots, sequels, movies kind of set in this time period. 
this movie did not rely on nostalgia. It wasn't like, hey, remember this thing? <laughs> wink, wink, remember this on TV thing or this kind of game show program? It did not rely on nostalgia. I felt like a lot of the bio, a lot of biopics that I've seen recently or biopics from this time, this is like late 70s, uh, early to mid 80s, rely heavily. I mean, rely heavily on nostalgia. I didn't really feel that at all. It knew what it wanted to focus on. It didn't shy away from that, from anything. It wanted to focus on the brothers and, you know, the rise to fame during this time, the world of wrestling during this time, like wrestling as a sport, sports, Olympics during this time. It was, oh, clothing, stuff like that. It was like a look this person's wearing, a members only jacket, whatever. No, it definitely, it, nothing kind of felt like, look, nostalgia, wink, wink. It was handled really properly. It wasn't relying too much on nostalgia and like, big things from this time period. I really appreciated that. Not Again, not being from that time period whatsoever, but I do think it's like a tool that filmmakers and movies use a lot of nowadays. So like, look at this, look at all, look, remember that commercial from Pepsi-Cola or like this thing, this, this kind of like this Walkman or like this device, whatever. It's, there was none of that in this movie. I thought it was done very well and very tasteful. What really impressed me too of this movie from Sean Durkin, the filmmaker, is that how the filmmaker is able to capture you so quickly. You were so invested into the story, each brother's story, and the family as a whole. Like he does a great job kind of catching up the speed and kind of saying who kind of who's saying who's who in the family, who's what, the background, the curse of this family, what this family has gone through, what they are going through, what they will go through, whatever. And really I was really impressed how like quickly I was engaged. Like the first five minutes I was like, okay, where are we going with this? And then it, when it kind of like shows we are now it's like oh okay now i'm into it it really captured me again as someone who was kind of like i don't want to see this movie i have no interest in this movie i don't really care like whatever i was quickly captured i'm like i'm in this movie i was never like okay let's get on with it whatever no it definitely captures you and it had me the two hours and five ten minute movie that it was like the, it, it captured me so quickly got me on board so quickly and you know recently i've been seeing myself like you, you can't get me in the first 20 30 minutes i'm out i, I don't care or whatever or opposite well i'll say like okay the first half wasn't good the second half kind of caught me this movie caught me really quickly got me invested got me like connected to these to these guys to the family to the story to the, to the whole thing overall it definitely caught me really kind of really quickly i think i give a lot of props to sean durkin as a writer as a director but also just kind of like the story itself really kind of just interested me it could also be a factor of like not knowing much about the wrestling not or not knowing much about the von erics prior to this but either way it worked for me right away the film overall felt like a mix of The Wrestler by Aronofsky, Raging Bull by Scorsese, and The Fighter by David O. Russell. But I feel like the tragedy and the curse of the family that, that these characters go through, what this family is cursed upon, is a character of its own. I think the tragedy, the curse, and the devastation is its own character of its own in its own movie. In terms of, in terms of direction and filmmaking, it's reminded me a lot of... Link later and Martin Scorsese again. It's a really weird hybrid mix. I felt that in the first hour, I'm like, this feels like a Link later, Richard Link later slash Martin Scorsese kind of hybrid. Because obviously Link later is from Texas. A lot of his movies are set in Texas. You know, obviously you know Days and Confused, Everybody Wants Them, Bernie. A lot of movies, like a lot of the movies are set in, in Texas where he's from, rightfully so. But it was very kind of like indie slash Link later slash Scorsese vibe, and I was like. I like that about it. Again, it was a really kind of weird thing that I kind of thought of during the th during the first like hour, and I was like, but I couldn't stop thinking like, yeah, it's like a link later sort of says you kind of hybrid genre of movie. Um, and if you're familiar with those filmmakers and directors in, in the filmography, you'll you'll see you'll see. The, you'll, I hope you see the similarity to the way I did. I was like, oh yeah, if you see it, you see it for sure. But really, like, it's just like Sean Durkin really is a name that, like I said, I'm really looking forward to seeing what he does next as a filmmaker, but he's making a name for himself in terms of filmmaking, but also dealing with this tragedy. And he said, I really have, I, I, so I'm keeping this non-spoiler as much as I can, because if you're not familiar with this, what the Von Erichs, I would advise you go in blind, not seeing the trailers, but also not looking up them the way I did, because it really added a lot to the story where I, want, I wanted to know more after seeing it. And there was a lot that I didn't know after seeing this movie. I don't, it's Hollywood's a biopic. I want to see the real story of it all. But if you can go in without knowing much about these guys, please do. Because it really adds a lot to the experience of the movie itself. So I recommend going in blind as much as you can. But said, it's all good movies do. You know, I love this movie. I do have a few cons. I will say what I noticed, what I noticed right away when she's introduced was the chemistry between Zac Efron and Lee James. 
it did not work for me really. I don't really feel the love or see why they liked each other. Maybe someone else should have been casted. Yeah, I'm a big Lily James fan. I think she's I think she's really a great actress. I thought she was great as uh, Pamela Anderson. She's great. She's great Cinderella. I loved her in Baby Driver, but I don't know. It just didn't feel natural. It felt really kind of just like crowbarred and forced at times. And I think maybe it would have been better if someone else was cast in her role, or maybe it could have been Zac Efron thing. Maybe they, he didn't work with her at all either. But like for some reason, the chemistry between the two of them did not work for me. I was like, I'll get it. You're your your lovers. Like these are kind of your first girlfriend, and it becomes your wife, obviously, um, and the mother of your kids. But it just didn't work. And when they were eating, during the scene on the first date, I just kind of it just felt very stiff. I mean, again, it, the first date kind of awkward and anxious, obviously. But when you see more of her throughout with Zac Efron, it just kind of just felt very just like not natural, not really real. I don't really feel I didn't really feel the love or see why they were like in love with each other. It kind of just felt just like thrown in there. So I, I think Lily James, again, much like thinks she's a great actress. I felt like she was kind of playing her character Deborah from Baby Driver. Same accent, kind of same kind of hairstyle, same kind of like vibe energy. I was like, are you playing Deborah again from Baby Driver? Because it felt like that whenever she was talking or what she kind of like love and her accent, stuff like that. So I was like, I think to me, someone else being cast might have benefited the chemistry or like seeing the love between uh, Kevin and his wife. So it's just like, it could have been made casted differently or. I don't know, but that's why I felt that's why I felt the chemistry between her and, Lil, and, and him and Lily James. As much as I love Zac Efron in this movie, I thought he's phenomenal. Boy, oh boy, his hair and his wig bothered me more and more and more and more. I like it felt so Hollywood and so fake and so wig. I was like, dude, maybe that's what they're going for, but like the wig, the, the his wig, his hairstyle the entire time felt so fake and so and so bad. I was like, dude. You're doing so good in this, but that thing on your head is just taking me away from your performance because it looks so fake. It looks so just like, I don't know, like, is that, is, that all they, is that all they had in terms of, like, hair, wigs, or stylists? But it was just like, oh, man, it was bothering me a lot. I just, like, I knew it was a wig the entire time. Like, some of the other hairstyles from, like, Jeremy Allen White to uh, Harris Dickinson to, like, other playing Mike, it, that, those wigs or their hair kind of felt natural. But, man, like, Zac Efron's wig or hair was terrible in this and something that I will agree with my fellow critics and fellow movie reviewers was that the mom in this does not have, not have a lot to offer. And, you know, Mar- Mart Tierney, who I, again, again was, again, was a phenomenal actress, feels, feels wasted at times. She's very one-dimensional and kind of like, hey, mom, make, make us dinner, make us food, or you can't do that, son. Oh, nope, that's a bad idea. I'm, I'm telling you no. It doesn't really feel really fleshed out or developed well. I don't know if that's part of the story or part of just like what they were going for, but it just felt like they could have explored the mom side of the tragedy because the mom goes through this movie so much. Oh my gosh. Like I can't even imagine that was my mom or any mom that I know. Like why well, the mom has to go through this, but like seeing what she has to go through this movie throughout and seeing the heartbreak and the loss and devastation, I feel like they could have been explored more, just giving more, giving her more to do. Because I felt like at times it was very just kind of like rushed or one dimensional. Like, oh yeah, mom's there to cook and clean and kind of like you know be religious, you know. And I was just like, oh man, if the movie explored more of her trauma and what she's going through, I would like I would like to see more of her because it really feels very one note and very movie kind of like typical mom at sort of typical mom at times. I was like, man, bit of a waste, but it, it's hard. I know it's probably hard to adapt this tra is real life tragedy and this the true story to screen. Um yeah, I think what Sean Durkin does is really remarkable, but I do think that the mom was kind of just like put to the side of just like, all right, whatever. You're when you're there, you're there. When when the camera's on you, you'll know, cry and whatever. But I think it could have been explored, kind of just like explored more through her eyes and her through her trauma. So a few cons, but yeah guys, I love this movie. I really did. You know, I, it's hard I I kind of wish I saw it before doing my top 10 of the year. I'm really debating replacing something out of my top 10 with this movie. It's still an honorable mention now, but I really, really thought this movie was something special, really remarkable. Uh, I, it's just, again, I like being proven wrong in general, but also about movies and like going to being surprised. Like I remember seeing Spider-Man Homecoming. Uh, a few years ago, I'm like, oh, like I'm dreading this. Like, if Tom Holland's a really bad Spider-Man, I don't want to see another Spider-Man movie. I love Andrew Garfield. I love Tom McGuire. Like, what are you doing? And I, you know, 
loved Spider Man Homecoming. I was like, wow, I need to shut the hell up because I was wrong about this. I love being proven wrong about movies. I love being proven wrong. I love being caught by surprise. And this, I was a proven wrong, but also caught by surprise of how good it was. And I recommend this movie to anyone. It's really a tearjerker. It sticks with you. It's really emotional. It's really hurting. But seeing it now two weeks ago, it's been in my mind nonstop. I was telling Zayden about it. I was telling my friends about it. Just like, I could not stop thinking about this movie. It was in my mind like for the past couple of weeks. And it's very something special. I think A24 has a winner on their hands. And like I said, it breaks my heart. That's kind of like, unfortunately, it's going to be not looked at by the Academy or the, gold, the, or the award season because I think it kind of came out maybe a little too late. But I wasn't giving enough attention. It's a shame because literally everyone in this movie brings their A game in terms of acting, direction, cinematography, score, all around. It's a phenomenal movie. I loved it. So I'm giving this a really solid 9 out of 10. 9 out of 10. Uh, like I said, it, if I had to edit my top 10 of last year, I'll let you guys know. I'll probably put it on our socials as well as my personal page. But whoa, boy, oh boy, what a movie. What a film. It's very, really, it's stuck with me. It probably will stuck with me for, for a little bit while. Definitely buying on Blu-ray when it comes out. But yeah, like I said, one of my favorite A20, one of my new favorite A24 movies and also one of the best A24 films that they produced recently. And again, kudos to Zach Efron for kind of taking a turn as an actor. Really, really great stuff seeing him turn to more of a dramatic, serious actor. But yeah, guys, 9 out of 10 for sure. Definitely see this movie, like I said, go in blind. If you knew nothing about this movie or no trailers and no other thing about the Von Erics, go in blind. You're going to be really just like glad you did, if you ask me. And Shane, the guy, so I sat in the back of the theater when I saw the guy, the two rows in front of me, 20 minutes in, all I heard was oh, snoring. And I was like, oh man, really? And I was like, uh-oh, what am, I, what am I in for? And I was like, I'm glad that wasn't the case whatsoever. But yeah, my man was knocked out for the first 20 minutes. So I'm like, oh, it's a damn shame. But what a film, guys. What a film. But those are my two films to recommend for you all this week on this review roundup slash audio newsletter. Again, we have a lot to a lot to explore this this month in terms of the podcast, and we're trying to grow the show more and more. Um, again, playing more games, we're trying to get more trying to get more guests on as well. We haven't had guests on in a while, and that's kind of like our fault for kind of just like being took up with our own our voices and our our show. So definitely look out for a few more guests. If you want to be on the show too, please DM me at the young jones or our, or our podcast page maybe we have new productions we're always looking for new guests to come on talk movies with talk about entertainment with because it's it's fun we love we love doing the show uh and we got lots to review this upcoming month i know we know me and nick will be definitely seeing argyle soon i'll probably be seeing the beekeeper this weekend got my mean girls review coming out with the normal with the regular episode of the podcast this week with the boys but a lot a lot coming up and then we got a lot coming out in february and march and april we have a lot of good things coming out and Hopefully a lot of things kind of stay in place in terms of release dates and uh, both streaming and movie and theatrical. I know that uh, the Bong Joon-ho, uh, Mickey 17, the big follow-up to his award-winning Parasite with Robert Pattinson got pulled off the calendar. Uh, it's coming out March 17th or somewhere in March, and now it delayed, got delayed indefinitely. And I'm kind of worried about that. I might, I might ask the boys about that on the podcast this week or me next week, but uh yeah, I'm kind of worried that uh, we might be seeing some more delays because of the strikes or whatever. But I hope that's not the case. I want to see a lot more films, a lot more original films, a lot just like just movies in general on the big screen, and even streaming too. Because I feel like it's a lot to a lot a lot of things to catch up on this uh, this year. So yeah, guys, hope you enjoy this review roundup slash audio newsletter this week. Again, look out for our look out for our full episode of the genre of your life podcast this weekend as well. And as always, guys. We will see you at the movies.